Praise the Lord. Uh, we're so happy to be here today. Just a little bit more, and that'll help me. Thank you, Pastor, for being uh, so gracious and kind to us. How many of you have, uh, have never been with us? I've been here about six years in a row. Have you never been here when I've been here? Raise your hand before. Okay, wonderful. Uh, great to see you guys, and wonderful to see those who are, have been here for a while. You know, something's happened in here. I, I travel extensively, and uh, you can discern the spiritual climate of churches. Uh, there's something different here. There's a, a presence of God, not to say that he hasn't been here all along, but there's a, a depth um, in the hearts of, of the people that are here. So uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I think perhaps that's why it was led in a different direction. You know, most of the times I've been here through the past years, we've come perhaps with a word of, of encouragement, maybe a word of, of prophecy concerning the church. You know, ch churches go through various seasons. Uh, uh, and in seasons, you know, there'll be changes, transitions, reorganization, redirection. Uh, people come, people go, and then things solidify, and you get uh, that group of individuals that are designated uh, in that house for a divine purpose. And I want to speak to you today. Amen. You know, every every church, uh, every ministry, if we if we wanted to say that, has its uh, specific what we would call spiritual DNA. Not all churches are alike. God raises up different churches for different purposes in different uh, communities to facilitate uh, what he may want to do through that particular body. And I believe that he's raised you up here and he sets you for a specific purpose. And I, I want to speak into that uh, today. Uh, now, most of you would know uh, that your pastors are graduates of Rama Bible Training Center. Uh, you've probably heard him say that. I'm also a graduate, and I know that some uh, of the members here have also been to that school. If you haven't, that's nothing against you. It's just I'm just making a comment. You know, uh, you don't have to go to Bible school to be mightily used of God. Amen. But at the, the same token, I, I make reference to that because I want to share some things with you today uh, about the founder of that Bible school uh, that has significance to all of us as the body of Christ. Uh, you know, I was um, privileged to travel with Kenneth E. Hagan, who was the founder of Rhema Bible uh, College for about 11 years. I followed his ministry since I was 18 years old, well over 30-something years, you know, before he transitioned. How many of you have heard, let me ask you this, how many of you are not familiar with Kenneth Hagan? Raise your hand if you're not. So most, okay, and if you're visiting or you hadn't been around, uh, you know, this particular body very long, you may not have heard of him. This generation, a lot of people have not. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Brother Hagen uh, was born in uh, 1917. I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about him because it's significant to you as a church, okay? Um, because of your spiritual heritage and what God has in store for you. Brother Hagen was born August the 20th, 1917. Now, this is very significant because uh, it's the same year that the Jews begin to migrate back to the land of Israel. Now, you know, in, in this uh, world in which we live, God uses the nation of Israel as a prophetic timepiece. Something in the natural that you and I can watch what's happening among the nations so we can discern the times and seasons in which we're living and how close we are to the return of Christ. So in 1917, when they begin to migrate back to the land of Israel, that marked the beginning of the end. Well, Brother Hagen was born in that very, very time. Now, uh, prior to his birth, uh, his mother was having trouble with the pregnancy. You know, uh, her husband would leave for weeks, sometimes months at a time. She didn't know where he was, ultimately left the family for good. How many of you know you don't have to come from a perfect family to be mightily used of God? Amen. Brother Hagen came from a dysfunctional family. And so, you know, his mother's under a great deal of stress. She's pregnant with Kenneth Hagen. He's got siblings. Let's see here. There we are. We're back. And so um, she's under a great deal of stress. Uh, and, and, you know, her parents were initially against the marriage. So she, she was hesitant to go for them, to them for help, even though they just lived a few blocks away. So finally she got desperate. She was hungry. So she said, I made my way down to my mom's house to get some food. This is her testimony. 
She said, it was a beautiful sunny August day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. I passed by my Aunt Mary's house on the sidewalk. She said, as I did, I heard what sounded like a, a wind that would blow through the leaves of a, of, of, of a tree, and yet there were no trees in the immediate vicinity. So she said, I kept walking. I heard this breeze again. She said, earlier when I began my journey, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. But as I looked up this second time after that breeze had blown, there was a single sky suspended in, excuse me, cloud suspended in the sky. And she said, all of a sudden as I'm watching this cloud, it began to descend rapidly. And she said, in a moment of time, that cloud is before me on the sidewalk and Jesus stepped out of that cloud. And he said, fear not, for the child shall be born, and he will bear witness concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he will have a part of the last great revival in the earth. And she said, he disappeared. Now, she said, naturally, it startled me. That's why he said, fear not. You notice all the angels, every time they show up, they say, fear not. Because quite naturally, it startles you in the natural. She said, I took off running <laughs> to my mom's house. And she said, when I got there, my mom said, what in the world happened to you? You're as white as a ghost. She said, I told her what happened. She said, I never mentioned it again. My mother never mentioned it again. She said, because in those days, if you told someone that Jesus stepped out of a cloud on front of, in front of you on the sidewalk, they'd think you were crazy. So she said, man, I, we weren't accustomed to such things. She was raised in a, in a certain denominational setting. We'd never heard of such as that. So I never told anyone. Well, later in Brother Hagin's life, in one of the uh, many visions that he did have, Jesus told him what he had done, that he appeared to his mother. He verified it. She said, well, that's exactly what happened. But I didn't tell anybody, you know. So long story short, uh, Brother Hagin had several commissions in life. Uh, of course, because he was born prematurely in that condition, by the time he was 15 years old, he's completely bedfast, paralyzed from the waist down, incurable heart condition, incurable blood condition. And on that bed... There we are. So on that bed, uh, for 16 months, he came to the revelation, as you well know, many of you, of Mark 11, 23 and 24. Uh, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you'll have them. Out of that revelation, as a 16-year-old boy, he was supernaturally healed, came off that bed of affliction, and uh, had 70, over 70 years of ministry. So quite naturally, one of the commissions of his ministry was, go teach my people faith. Uh, uh, the Lord said, I've, uh, you've gone through certain experiences in life. You've learned the principles of faith. I want you to teach others. But what people are not uh, perhaps familiar with is a second commission, which was to bear witness concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ and to have a part of the last great revival in the earth. Now, Brother Hagin was what we would call a prophet and a teacher. Now, I understand sometimes people think that's a little strange. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. And as I give the reference, they'll put up the, the scriptures there. Uh, Ephesians 4 and 11, he said, When Christ ascended, he gave gifts unto men, first apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So prophets and teachers, quite naturally, and all the rest of them, are, are uh, gifts that are uh, present in this New Testament dispensation. And as a prophet, many times people in that office will see and speak by revelation, just like Old Testament prophets did. So thinking about him bearing witness concerning the second coming of Christ, I want to share two visions with you that pertain to the time that you and I are living in right now as we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So he had two visions as a young man. Are vision scriptural in the New Testament dispensation? Absolutely. How do we know? Well, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last day, saith God, I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Right? Your young men shall See visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So if you happen to have a dream and you don't want to be considered old, just say it was a night vision, right? 
So he had two visions as a young man. He had many, but these are the two pertinent to our discussion. The first one, when, when he was 33 years old, 1950, September the 2nd, he was in Rockwall, Texas. He was holding what they had in those days, a tent meeting. They still have some today occasionally, but in that day they were more prevalent. He said it had rained all day, and because of that, very few people came out. About 40 people came out to the tent meeting that night. He said he gave a short Bible lesson, and about 9.30 he asked people to come down to pray. Now, he's, you've got to understand, I not only read the books, but I traveled 11 years, heard these stories two times a day, 150, 180 times a year. See what I'm saying? So I might have a little more information. So he said, you know, he had him come down to pray. He said he knelt down by a folding chair. He began to pray in the spirit. He made note of the fact he'd never expected to happen. What did happen, never asked for it, never did any more a particular praying or fasting. Uh, but it just happened. He said all of a sudden he heard this voice say, come up here. Well, he thought some kids were outside the tent playing, so he kept praying. He said all of a sudden he heard the voice again, come up here. So he said he opened his eyes, and when he did, there was Jesus standing where the top of the tent pole should be. Now, he said in a moment of time, not literally, but because he's having an open vision where your physical senses are intact, but you're seeing in the spirit realm. He said in a moment of time, of course, from his view, the people disappeared, the tent, uh, everything in the natural, and he's standing before Jesus uh, in this vision. Now, this vision is multifaceted. It's where he was given the commission to teach my people faith, given the commission to minister healing and so forth with a special anointing. But I want to discuss the, the parts of the vision that are pertinent to us today. Now, in one part of this vision, uh, he said he was suspended in what appeared to him to be space because he could see for miles and miles around, but it was utter darkness. There was not a bird, a bush, a tree, vegetation of any kind. He said just darkness, except off on the western horizon, he could see a small dot of light. And he said as he was watching this light, all of a sudden it began to move toward him, and as it came closer, he could see it was a horse. Then, of course, as it came closer, he could clearly see there was a rider on the horse. Then as it approached him, he said there was a rider on a horse. He was holding the reins of the horse in his right hand and a scroll high above his head in his left hand. He said when he came to a stop, he passed the scroll from his left hand to his right. He handed to Brother Hagin and said, open and read. Brother Hagin said he opened the scroll in this vision. It was about 12 to 14 inches long, a parchment. And he said as he began to read, he was struck dumb. He couldn't speak. The, the angel, I suppose it was an angel, laid hands on his head said read in Jesus name and he began to read now there were parts of this scroll that pertain particularly to America and the impending judgment that would come if repentance wasn't made but I want to emphasize the parts that pertain to all of us as the body of Christ okay which is on the top of the scroll written in bold black letters four or five times were these words now I want you to remember this is 1950 the time of the end of all things is at hand. The time of the end of all things is at hand. The time of the end of all things is at hand four or five times. Then he said, Jesus turned to him in this vision and said, this is the last great revival. He said, now, in the days just ahead, the church shall begin to make tremendous advancements in the earth through the power of the Holy Spirit. All of the gifts of the Spirit will be in manifestation. The, the church, this latter-day church, will do greater exploits than the early church. They will have greater signs, wonders, and miracles, and a greater impact in the earth than the, those recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. Then it was written on this scroll... As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. As I finally spoke to Noah and said, In yet seven days I'll cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and will destroy every living thing that I've created from the face of the earth, even now I'm speaking to this generation. And he said, warn this generation. Tell them the time they have left. And he said, warn them as Noah did his. Tell them the time they have left is comparable, and that's a key word, to the last seven days of Noah 
prior to the flood. We're in the seventh decade since that vision. We tend to think on our human scale in days, weeks, and months. God thinks prophetically in year, months, years, decades, centuries, right? So uh, he said comparable uh, to the last seven days of Noah prior to the flood. He said, tell my people uh, judgment is coming upon the earth. They need to be watchful. They need to be attentive. They need to be prepared. He said, uh, I will take them out before the worst shall come. Hallelujah. I'll take that. Right. He said, but again, he's turned to him in this vision for the second time. He said, now, this is the last great revival. And then on the scroll, one more time, was written these final words, the time of the end of all things is at hand. Amen. So that's the first one, and we'll, we'll revisit it in thought. Now, the second one was 12 years later, 1962. He's in Houston, Texas. Something about Texas, I don't know. Rockwall and now Houston. But he's in a very small meeting. You know, amazing things can happen in small groups of people whose hearts are hungry for God. You can revolutionize an entire city and region. Amen. And so he's in a small meeting. He's telling them about this vision of 1950 and how he was given the healing commission because he's going to minister, you know, along those lines. All of a sudden he said the power of God hit him. He fell under the power. He fell in a trance and had a vision. Now some people's minds say, come on now, trance, vision. Is that scriptural? Absolutely. Acts chapter 10. Remember, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. What happened? He fell into a trance and he had a, a vision. Acts 10, 10 and 11. And then that was when he was given the revelation concerning the Gentiles. So he has this, this a vision. Now, this was 1962. He said in this vision, he walked up to what appeared to him to be a white, uh, a flower garden. It was surrounded by a white picket fence. He said there were flowers all over this fence. The aroma was breathtaking. He said as he approached the gate, Jesus met him there at the gate. Uh, took him uh, by the hand, pulled him through the gate. And he said, we held hands and we walked down the center path of this garden to an arbor. And this arbor was covered likewise with flowers. And the, the aroma was absolutely breathtaking. Taking. And he said there were two white marble seats under this uh, arbor. Jesus sat on one and motioned for me to sit down on the other. He said, I'd come in from the east, so as I was looking toward the west, I saw this huge river. And it was pouring tons of water into this garden. It went up into the air about 50 feet at its widest diameter, and it narrowed as it came down. And he said, I'm watching it, I mean pouring tons of water, and all of a sudden, before my eyes, the water transformed into people. Millions of people. And they're flowing into this garden. He said they were dressed in every walk of life. Uh, you know, you had people in suits, e women in evening gowns. You had people in, in uh, uh, you know, what we would call uh, um, blue-collar workers. Uh, you know, just different uh, housewives, people from every walk of life and every, different nationalities and religions. And he turned to Jesus and he said, Lord, who are these people? 1962. Jesus said, that it, this is that which I will do now in this last hour. I'm going to begin to visit hungry hearts. Wherever hearts are open to me, wherever hearts are hungry for me. He said, people that you see in this river are what you call, because we don't, you know, he sees his body as the body, what you call denominational people. He said, there are also people from other religions, every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every religion, wherever hearts are open to me and hungry for me. I'm going to visit them. I'm going to bring them into the fullness of salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, you will have a part of this, right? And so I don't know if you know your church history. That was 1962. But friends, in the 1960s, there were no covenant life churches. The rock Revolution Church, Abundant Life. None of that existed. 
There were only mainline denominational churches, and thank God for them because they carried the message of salvation. But they knew nothing about, of course, uh, the deeper things of the Spirit, like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, you know, there were only mainline denominational churches, Baptist, Methodist, which I was Baptist, uh, uh, Catholic, Episcopalian, Wesleyan, a couple of uh, full gospel denominations like the Assemblies of God and the Church of God and so forth. But Jesus said, now, here we go. This is it. This is the last great revival. And I'm going to start visiting. Well, if you were around in that time, uh, you know that that's exactly what happened. In 1967, the winds of the Holy Spirit began to glow, blow across this nation and across the world. And people began to not only be born again, but baptized in the Holy Spirit by the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. I was 18 years old, man, Southern Baptist, loved God, but I went to a Catholic Bible study. <laughs> and Father O'Brien had been born again and baptized with the Holy Ghost in the charismatic outpouring. And I came out baptized with the Holy Spirit, speaking in a supernatural language I'd never heard before. Hallelujah. Changed my life. Changed the whole course of my life. And so, it began to happen. So, when I read those words again, not too many years ago, this is the last great revival. I told my wife, now, wait a minute. People have been, we're looking for revival. Jesus said, this is it. We're in the last great revival. So we've had different waves. I'm all for a grand finale. But I said, I want to find out what's happened in the body of Christ over the last 50 years. And friends, it's absolutely astounding. Let me just give you a few statistics. On the continent of Africa, how many of you will be patient with me this morning? Let me get this out. Uh, uh, because you don't have anywhere to go but lunch, right? So on the continent of Africa, in the 1960s, there were 400 million people on the entire continent. Out of 400 million people, only 10 million were Christian. In 50 years, a little over since 1967 forward, there are now close to 600 million Christians. There are 1.2 billion people on that continent now. Almost 600 million every single day uh, from Vision 2020, Open Door Ministries. I did a, a consensus of all these different organizations. Any Somewhere around 20,000 people are converted to Christianity every single day on the continent of Africa. Africa. Hallelujah. Amen. In China, you know, and, and so many of them, most of them baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. You know, Reinhard Bonnke went home with the Lord recently. Uh, but, you know, he started preaching in 1967 over there in Africa. And by the time he passed, over 50 million souls had come to Christ through that ministry alone. Hallelujah. So anyway, in China, you know, at the turn of the century there back in the 19, well, I say 19, 1950s, not the turn of the century, but 1950s, the communist regime, they expelled all the missionaries from China. They left behind one million Catholics and three million evangelicals. In 50, a little over 50 years, that number has grown from one million evangelicals to well over 200 million evangelicals, most of them baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in China is amazing. And those are just the ones we can count because there are millions in underground churches, uh, secret meetings, particularly now because of the, the uh, persecution that's occurring. That bamboo curtain was up for a while. Now it's, it's closing. And, and so, you know, uh, statistically, every single day, somewhere between, between 10 and 25,000 Chinese come to faith in Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, of course, uh, India. India has 85 million Christians. They're fifth in the world for Pentecostal Christianity. Every single month, 100,000 Hindus convert to Christianity. Amen. 
Latin America, Latin America. Uh, you know, uh, back in the 1960s, there were only 18 million evangelicals in the whole of Latin America. And they had 12.6 million Pentecostals. Now, in a little over 50 years, there are 480 pushing 500 million uh, uh, evangelicals, 70% of them baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the Pentecostal denomination has grown to over 148 million. 40% of all the world's Pentecostals live in Latin America. We're talking about the particular denomination. Uh, but the Catholic Church for a season said, and these were their statistics, uh, not that we're in competition with the Catholic Church, but they said that 35,000 Catholics were transitioning to evangelical Christianity every single day. And we're being also baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's why, of course, they're attempting to bring some harmony between that. But uh, anyway, uh, just to say we're all the body of Christ. Amen. Just want to let you know what's happening. Good things are happening. South Korea. At the turn of the century, South Korea was deemed impenetrable to the gospel. No Protestant churches. In 50 years... Now, 33% of South Korea is saved. They have 7,000 churches just in Seoul, Korea, and several of those churches have over a million parishioners. Uh, I got a link from a, a friend of mine uh, who's a missionary. He sent me a link to uh, Al Jazeera satellite television where there was a Muslim cleric and a fellow Muslim uh, interviewing him. Now remember Jesus said, I'm going to visit not only uh, uh, denominations, but I'm going to visit religions, nationalities, every nation, every kindred, every tongue. In this interview, the Saudi cleric said, uh, and they had the captions, a tragedy is occurring in Islam. He said, what's the tragedy, sir? He said, 667 an hour. 16,000 a day, almost 6 million a year of our Muslims are converting to Christianity worldwide. He said, the interviewer said, you're mistaken. You mean from all other religions to Christianity. He said, no, from Islam alone. Well, you know, um, Indonesia is one of the largest Muslim countries in the world every single year. One million converts to Christianity. Iran is one of the top ten persecutors of Christians in the world. And did you know 70% uh, of their population is 30 years old and younger? These are young men and women. Every single month, 500 of them a month are coming to faith in Christ amidst great persecution. So these are young men and women. Uh, of course, Sudan, a million converts in the last 10 years. What am I saying to you this morning? The body of Christ is alive and well. We've been in revival for over 50 years on a global scale, and it continues every single day. You're the largest religion in the world, 2.18 billion. You're the fastest growing religion in the world. Christianity's at 6.9 annually. Islam at... Uh, 2.7, I uh, think the Hindus are 1.2, and then, uh, uh, I mean, 2.1, uh, and then the, the, uh, uh, the uh, what's the other one? Buddhist are about 1.7. So you're the fastest growing religion in the world. We don't count births. We count new births. Regeneration, right? <laughs> so it's awesome. Jesus said this end time church will far exceed and excel though the early church. The most we see saved in the book of Acts at one time, 3,000, later 5,000. Guess what? That happens almost every 25 minutes now. By the time you lay your head down tonight and, and open your eyes in the morning, there'll be 175,000 new Christians on the planet. Hallelujah. There are more Christians on the planet than there were people in 1900. 1900, there was 1 1.6 billion. Now there's 2.18 billion Christians alone. Woo! 
The harvest is being reaped. And don't, don't, you know, don't become too disheartened about America. Barner Research says, you know, about 75% of, of Americans claim Christianity. We know that that may vary upon the degree of, of commitment, but they claim it. And that'd be about 250, uh, 225 or so million. And, and then you've got... Um, 51% of them also claim the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, 112 million. There's a lot going on in America. Uh, did you know that now you who are born again believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Where you, whether or not you've experienced that yet will give you the opportunity. But, but uh, who have learned the truths, you understand, in the 60s, we didn't know God was good and the devil was the problem. We didn't know we had authority in Jesus' name. We didn't know we were redeemed from the curse of the law. Friends, all of that has been revived in this uh, generation. Hallelujah. And thank God for it. Now you hold, you're the largest segment of Protestant Christianity in the world. This element of the body of Christ. All in 50 years. It's amazing. Just got back from Brazil. I go there a lot. God has opened that nation to us. Uh, you talk about fire. Whew, it's awesome. And it's still on fire. Amen. So I said all that to say this, friends. God is moving. The church is alive and well. We're in the end time harvest. Jesus is coming. Right? But the point is, what do we do as we wait? What's the plan? I'm going to tell you his plan. His plan is the same plan he's always had. His plan is you and me. The sons and the daughters. The servants and the handmaidens. Born of the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. Empowered by the Spirit. Impacting people's lives supernaturally. Yeah. Amen. You remember Acts 2? Uh, beginning in 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Right? Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. You need to begin to expect these things. And upon my servants and my handmaidens, not the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher exclusively. Thank God for these gifts. But it's the body of Christ. I'll pour out of my spirit and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath. Woo! Verse 21. And it will come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you leave this room today, I want you to know you're on assignment from Almighty God. This is your season. And you've been planted here in this church for this time and this season to impact this community supernaturally. Hallelujah. Listen, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, the world would never be the same again. His entrance marked the beginning of a new time, a new day, a new season, a new way of doing things. Just 120 ordinary people in an upper room. Upon having an encounter with the Holy Spirit, they made an impact on the entire city of Jerusalem. That day launched 120 ordinary people into extraordinary lives. It transformed a group of individuals who were timid and fearful into bold and courageous believers anointed of the Holy Ghost. The visitation of God was so powerful on that day, 3,000 souls were saved. The visitation of God was so powerful on that day that cities round about Jerusalem brought their sick, their lame, their, their oppressed and laid them in the streets. And the Bible says they were healed every one. That was the early church. We're the latter church. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 3.1 says to everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. Listen, this is our season. As the body of Christ, it's time for us to rise. You know, what we do, we have to do quickly. We have to do powerfully. We have to do accurately. And it cannot be done in the arm of the flesh. It must be done by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Brother Hagen, before he transitioned to heaven in 2003, we were in a Holy Ghost meeting, and he began to prophesy. Now, these words weren't for him, they're for us. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, if it could be told you, if it were possible for you to look into the future and see that which is in store, your hearts would be glad. If you could look into the future and see that which is coming, he said, it would be difficult for some of you even to believe, but it shall surely come. The power of God in manifestation shall come. And where there's been a few saved here, a few filled with the Spirit here, a few healed here, many shall be saved. Many will be healed. Many will be filled with the Spirit. An outstanding healing here, an outstanding healing there, many healings. He said, as Elijah said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. First, he said, I see a cloud rising the size of a man's hand rising out over the sea. You remember that in 1 Kings 18? Brother Hagin said, I see a cloud rising on the horizon of time. And I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. He said, glory to God. The rain is coming. The latter rain falling upon his saints, falling upon good ground. And when that spirit manifests himself, all those around will be blessed. Not only will you be blessed and your family be blessed, but everyone you come in contact with will be blessed. Now listen, because here's the clincher, and this is what I want to talk to you about. The prophecy went on to say, now sit and say, let's see it come. And when it comes, I'll rejoice. And nothing will happen. Isn't that amazing? The word went on to say, arise. Leap into the water. The depths of the water. What does he mean? The spirit. Not just waters to wade in. Waters to swim in. What does he mean? The depths. Right? And he said, and if you will, the rain will come. The glory will fall. The healings will be in greater manifestation and your hearts will be glad. Now, why would he say, sit and say, let's see it come and nothing will happen? Because every single one of us understand in here that even in the natural, the purposes or intentions of the head always depend upon the cooperation of the body. It doesn't matter how much my head wants to walk to Pastor David. If this body doesn't carry this head, this head's not going anywhere. Colossians 1.18, what does it say? Christ is the head of the body. And we are what? The members of that body. So quite naturally, the purposes and intentions of the head are dependent upon the cooperation of the body. Right? So he needs us. But guess what? Here's a further dilemma. If the purposes of the head are dependent upon the cooperation of the body, guess what? I cannot and you cannot participate in things that we do not perceive. Right? And I cannot perceive the leadings of the Spirit unless I am living and walking in the Spirit. Now, when I talk about walking in the Spirit, I'm not talking about walking around in some kind of trance, being weird and goofy. I'm talking about being naturally supernatural. I'm talking about a place that we occupy in God through the person and fellowship of the Holy Ghost where we see things and we know things and we perceive things that we would not know or see or perceive otherwise. Think about it. The Apostle John, Revelation 1 and 10, what did he say? I was what? In the Spirit on the Lord's day. Right? And then he goes on to describe things that he saw. Why did he see them? Why did he perceive them? Because he was in the Spirit. Right? And so, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 Uh, Notice what he said, and I think it's 9 through 12. I have not seen, naturalized, ear have not heard, 
Neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him, but he's revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So what's the point? Natural ears aren't going to hear some things. There are some things your natural eyes will not see. There are some things that your intellect will not allow you to perceive. They've got to be seen and perceived by the Holy Ghost. Right? So if I'm going to perceive the leadings of the Spirit, then I've got to be living and walking in the Spirit. Is that making sense? Notice, let me give you an example. How many of you can give me five more minutes? Come on, raise your hand. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. All right, praise God. <laughs> Woo! Acts 14. Look at, look at this. Acts 14, 8 through 10. Paul's preaching in Lystra. Look here. There was a man who was impotent at his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who'd never walked. Watch this. The same heard Paul speak, who, speaking of Paul, steadfastly beholding and what? Perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said, stand up right on your feet. And man, the guy uh, stood up and he leaped and he walked. Now, did you notice the perception preceded the action. Paul perceived what God wanted. He was looking at that man. Now what's going on? There's an internal conversation. Not a vision or a voice per se. A sense. A perception. Right? And so he picked up on that. And he acted accordingly. And a miracle was forthcoming. I'm convinced that the most effective faith, particularly in ministering to other people, is that which is initiated by and empowered by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because really, this is how Jesus lived his life. Uh, John chapter 5 and verse 19, notice what he said. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. What he sees the Father do. Whatever he does, the son does likewise, right? Basically. So what is he saying? He said, look, this is how I live my life. This is how I execute my ministry. In direct response to the father's leading through the person of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, man, he impacted people's lives supernaturally. And guess why he gave us the example? He wants us to do the same thing. Wants us to do the same thing. So... You know, I didn't tell you this part of the vision in 1950, but it's awesome. You remember when he was kneeling there in the tent and he said Jesus was at the top of the tent pole? And he said, in a moment of time, I'm standing before him. The very first thing that happened, Jesus was holding a crown. Brother Hagin said this crown was beyond description. There were jewels in this crown, gold in this crown. He said it was absolutely beautiful. And he asked the Lord, what, what is that crown? And Jesus said, well, this is the soul winner's crown. Wow. But now listen. But he said, you know, I say to my people, go here, go there, minister to this one, uh, speak to that one. He said, but my people are insensitive. They're busy. They're preoccupied. And they miss what we would call their divine cues. Right? And he said, as a result, souls are lost. People go unministered. Why? Because the head needs the body. We're the voice. We're the hands. We're the feet. And he's depending on us. Right? So what I want you to see, and I hope you'll go out with this realization this morning. You're here in this planet on assignment. Your citizenship is in heaven. Thank God we can come and hear the word and be refreshed and fellowship. But our job is the moment we leave those doors, God wants us to impact people's lives in our particular sphere of influence. All of us have a sphere of influence. Now, you don't have to make things up and be weird, but you do have to follow your divine cues. And they may be subtle. It seems like I should pray for that person. May I pray for you? You see what I mean? Yeah. Test it out and you don't have to be weird. I, I, my sister, she's not a Bible school graduate. She doesn't have an arsenal of Bible verses at her disposal. She knows enough to be dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. 
But man, she's got a business raising a kid. But you know what she does? She stays in communion with the Holy Ghost. If she's, if she's vacuuming. I worship you, Jesus. She's washing the dishes. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I give you praise. Nurturing the presence of God, right? She has the most amazing experiences. Can I tell you one? So she said she was going to the bank. Didn't put on any makeup. We're from the South. Southern girls like their makeup. She didn't intend on going in, in anywhere, you know. She's just going to go through the drive through at the bank. So she says, Marty, she calls me Bubba. She said, Bubba, I was going down the road I always go to. Uh, to the bank. And she said, there's an antique store on the left. I pass it all the time. But she said, this day, I had a sense. Once again, not a voice, not a vision, a, a sense. And you'll become accustomed to those as you spend more time in the spirit, which we'll talk about. But anyway, she said that I should go into that uh, antique store. So she said, you know, I, I didn't have any makeup on, so I overrode it. So I kept driving. She said, as I did, I got grieved. There's a, this sense of, oh, man, you're missing it. So she said, I know the spirit. So she said, man, I turned around, went into the parking lot, went into that antique store, had no idea why I was there. Just following the step, you see, one step at a time. That perception. She said, so I'm looking at antiques, and all of a sudden I see a woman and a man over on the dis in the distance. They're ca carrying on a conversation. And she said, when I saw that woman... I knew, Bubba, that was my divine target. Now, my sister's bold as a lion. You want to know why? Because when you know him and you're full of the word and you're full of faith, you're bold as a lion. You don't care what people think. You don't make a fool of yourself, but you know what you know. So she went over and she said, ma'am, uh, excuse me for interrupting your conversation. She said, but, uh, and she looked that woman in the eye. She said, I'm here on assignment from almighty God. Well, she said, I didn't even know what the assignment was. <laughs> you take a step, they'll take one. So she said, I'm here on assignment from Almighty God. She said, when she spoke those words, that woman started crying and weeping, man. And she started telling her story. And she said, you know, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. She said, I went to Sunday school when I was young and I got saved. She said, but I've been backslidden for many years. And she said, the worst thing that's happened to me now is I've been diagnosed with cancer seven places in my body. They, they've given me no hope. And she said, I've been crying out to God to heal me and to forgive me. And she said, to think I would, he would come here and he would visit me in an antique store. You know he will? If you and I'll take, take our cues and go. She didn't have a pastor. She didn't have a church, but God knew her name and where she was and heard her voice and sent one of his kids to take care of it. Not apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, a handmaiden of the Lord. My sister said, well, honey, that's why I'm here. So she shared a few verses about the, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. He loves you, that so forth. And then she said, now let me pray for you. There wasn't any lightning from heaven. No shaking. She just gently put her hands on her head because the power's in the name. And she said, in the, right there in the antique store, very quietly, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of fear and death. That's what she said she prayed. Come out of you. And for you to be healed from the tip of your toes to the top of your head in Jesus' name. She took her hands off the ladies crying. My sister gives her a big old hug. She says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the bank now. And so the lady said, well, can I take your picture and get your number with my cell phone? She said, well, sure. So she did. You know the story. I'm, I'm just telling you. Several months later, I think it was, she got a call from that lady. She said, Miss Blackwelder, do you remember me in the antique store? My sister said, oh, yes. Yeah, not every day you're laying hands on somebody in the antique store. I remember you. She said, I had to call and tell you something. I got to feeling so much better, not only in my personal reconciliation with God, but in my body. So I went back and I asked them to, to run tests. They said, there's no need. I said, please. So they ran tests. She said, I wanted to call and tell you it came back negative. There's no cancer anywhere in my body. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you guys listen so well. It's just 1119. 
I know we're not used to, you know, it's hard to keep your attention these days with all the multimedia. Everybody do this. Woo! Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, let me tell you another story then. So anyway, I, I, I had some Jehovah's Witness come to the door one day. <laughs> and I went out on the stoop to talk with them on the porch. And you got the trainer and the trainee. You familiar with that? So the trainee, he's young and he's learning. And, uh, and uh, of course, he's trying to give his little, you know, run through the Bible. And he, he doesn't know where scriptures are, so I'm trying to help him, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind and cordial. He's trying to do something, you know. So anyway, I'm listening intently. But, but you know, all the time he's grimacing like he's in pain. And then he'd hold the side of his mouth. Finally, I just said, hey, what's the matter with you? And he said, man, I'm sorry. He said, I, I've got so much pain in my jaw. He said, I think I must have an abscess tooth or something. I'll go tomorrow and get it fixed. Well, while he said that, I got a cue. Now, I didn't come up with this on my own. I had a sense of perception. I need to pray for you. I said, hey, can I make you a deal? He said, well, I guess so. I said, now, I've listened with kindness and courtesy to everything you've shared. But I'm a born-again Christian. I, I, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through Him. And I said, so listen, may I share with you? Very quickly, what I believe uh, to be the path to salvation. You know how the four spiritual laws, or the Roman road, you call it. And I said, and if what I share with you is true, that same Jesus will heal you instantly. Now, I'm acting on a perception, not presumption. See what I mean? <laughs> so I shared with him. He said, okay. Now, the trainee wa trainer was not too excited about it. But the trainee was because he was hurting so I shared it real quick, and then I said, now let me pray for you. And I put my hand on the side of his head, and like I said, I didn't go, woo! <laughs> I like to do that. That's kind of fun, you know, in church sometimes. But that's not the time and place, right? <laughs> to scare the daylights out of people. <laughs> so I just laid my head on the side of his head like that. And I said, very calmly, I, said, I wanted to get it all in. So I said, in the name of Jesus, the name above every name, the name whereby men must be saved, that name, the way, the truth, and the life, be healed in Jesus' name. I took my hands off. God's my eternal witness. That guy's eyes got big as saucers. He said, it's gone. The pain's gone. And uh, he got so excited, I'm about ready to close the deal. And the trainer grabbed him and ran off the front porch. <laughs> I'm having to chase him down the street, you know. <laughs> you know, God loves people. Yeah. And did you know he'll heal sinners? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's great advertisement. I had a drunk guy one night. I came up. He was just drunk as a skunk. I said, listen to me. Don't you know God loves you? Yeah. I said, he doesn't want you to live like this. I know it. I said, I, I, listen, I want to pray for you. He, Jesus loves you. He died for you. So he's, I know it. So I took his hand. When I took his hand, God is my, I didn't expect it to happen. When I took his hand, the anointing went into him and instantly evaporated yeah. that alcohol out of his bloodstream. And he cussed. He said, D. He said the D word, D. I'm sober. I said, I know you are because Jesus wants you to pay attention to what I'm telling you. <laughs> we prayed with him, gave him a little money to go get something to eat. Amen. Oh, friends, listen. That's who we are. That's who we are. That's who you're here to be. In this church, in this community. Because you know what? That's what's going to fill up the, 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 the churches in America is, is the demonstrations of the love of God. And that's what it is. You know, uh, we do our part. We leave the results with him. Amen. We take our divine cues. So uh, I, I want to close with this. You know, if we're going to perceive the leadings of the spirit, quite naturally you have to live and walk in the spirit. And if we're going to live and walk in the spirit, guess what? We got to stay filled with the spirit. 
right? Ephesians 5.18, Paul said, don't be drunk with wine where is in excess, but do what? Be filled with the Spirit, right? That verb is one of continuance. Be ye being filled. I got something I'm going to use at the end. I got a track I'm going to use. Thank you, though, brother. You're so sweet. Uh, but um, be ye being filled. So that's a verb of continuance, right? So it's something that we can do. If you're going to be continually filled with the Spirit, then, uh, you know, there's certain spiritual exercises that you can incorporate into your life on a regular basis that nurtures a life in the Spirit. And one of those that I want to emphasize as we're closing is to pray more earnestly in the Spirit. Now, you may be here this morning and you've never heard that terminology or you haven't had that experience. That doesn't make, make you a second-rate Christian. It's just a beautiful experience that's available to you that would be a blessing to your life, right? So when Paul said pray in the Spirit, what does that mean? Well, we let the Bible interpret the Bible. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 2. This is the Apostle Paul, the author of half of the New Testament, if you count the book of Hebrews. What did he say? He who speaks in an unknown tongue, that means it's unknown to you. An unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. How be it, watch this, in the Spirit. He speaks mysteries, right? So Paul said, to speak in in the Spirit is to speak in a supernatural language called unknown tongues that accompanies, uh, as you would read in Acts chapter 2, what the Bible calls the baptism or infilling of the Holy Spirit, where you can and I can communicate with God as a new creation in Christ, a citizen of heaven, on a level and in a dimension that supersedes the natural intellect and ability, right? Now watch what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 14, 14 and 15. He said, if I speak in an unknown tongue, what's happening? My spirit, and that's what you are. You're not a body. You're a spirit. You live in a body. And guess what? If you stepped out of that body, you'd still have form, right? And you'd be who you are. But you're a spirit being, and you can talk as a spirit being. He who speaks in an unknown tongue, right? Uh, when I'm speaking in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but guess what? My understanding or my intellect is unfruitful. I don't necessarily know what I'm saying. Why? Because I'll pray with the spirit. I'll pray with the understanding also. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding also. Paul said, look, you can communicate with God in two dimensions. The natural, which you learn in your brain, right? Or the supernatural, which is a supernatural language that you can speak to Him spirit to spirit, heart to heart. Now, is this language beneficial? Obviously so. How do we know? Well, look at Paul said, 1 Corinthians 14, 18 and 19. Notice what he said. I thank my God. I speak in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 and in an unknown tongue. What's he saying now? He said, look, I really value this praying in the Spirit. And he said, I do it a lot. And I do it more than any of you. Right? But he said, now, in the church, I want to speak for your edification in an understandable language like I'm doing this morning. Right? Well, if he spoke in tongues more than all the Corinthian church put together, but it wasn't in the church, where was it? In his personal, private, devotional life Paul prayed excessively in this language of, of the Spirit. And as a result, he had signs, wonders, miracles, revelation, as we said, two-thirds of the New Testament. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. So let me give you three quotes, and I'm going to close. Howard Carter, who was the founder of the First Pentecostal Bible College in Great Britain, he said, listen, speaking in tongues is not just the initial evidence of being filled with the Spirit. But it is to be a continual source of infilling throughout one's life. A flowing stream that never runs dry. How many of you have heard of Smith Wigglesworth? 
27 people raised from the dead documented. Now watch what he said. He said, you know, uh, it's a luxury to be filled with the Spirit. But it is also a divine command. Not to be drunk with wine where is in excess, he said, but to be filled with the Spirit. He said, no Pentecostal person should get up out of bed in the morning without first getting lost in the Spirit, speaking in other tongues. <laughs> That's a good way to start the day. But he said, I maintain the opinion. If one would be continually filled with the Spirit, he will speak in the Spirit morning, noon, and night. Here's my final quote. John G. Lake, apostle to the continent of Africa, tremendous healing ministry here in America. Notice what he said. He said, I want to speak to you with the utmost frankness concerning this particular language of tongues, which I speak mostly in the nighttime, he said. For I found it to be not only the source of power that I operate in on a daily basis, but also an invaluable source of revelation that I preach to people every day. He said, man, it's a source of power. It's a source of revelation. Is it? If his assertion is true, it should be able to be substantiated from the scripture. Look what Paul said, 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He said, he who speaks in an unknown tongue does what? And defies himself. He who prophesies edifies the church, right? So the, the, the Knox translation says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue strengthens his own faith. The Beck translation says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue encourages himself. This is my favorite, the Webster. He who speaks in an unknown tongue receives an uplifting and strengthening influence. What is that influence? The Holy Spirit of God. Listen, I love you. I believe in this church. I believe in the commission on this church. I believe God wants to use every single person to be a handmaiden, a servant of the Lord, impacting people's lives. This is your spiritual heritage, whether you realize it or not. Men of faith, men and women of faith and the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 6 and verse 5, when it talks about Stephen, Stephen was what? A man full of faith and full of the Holy Ghost, right? And then I don't know, somewhere at Acts 13 or somewhere 11, I think Acts chapter 11, talking about Barnabas. It says, uh, Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. This is your heritage. And when you're full of faith and you're full of the Holy Ghost, you impact people's lives supernaturally. And this is your call and commission. Covenant Life Church. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. we got a work to do. And He's going to use every one of us. Amen. I want you to stand up this morning. Before we go, stand up in a sense of reverence here. And I want to ask you a question. Now, now listen, we're all family here. If you're visiting and these are strange things to you, just hang around. It'll come to light. It's not weird. All of us were introduced to deeper things of the Lord and the Bible at some point, things we'd never heard of or experienced. No need to fear them. Hunger for them. And God will meet you there. But if you're here this morning and you've never been born again, I've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart because the gospel message is simple. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the invitation. But this is the response that he demands. If you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord, the Bible says you will be saved. Because with the heart man believes, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Jesus said very plainly, he said, listen, I love you. This is the invitation. If you will confess me, he said, before men, then I'll confess you before my Father when you stand before him. But if you deny me before men, then I will deny you the day you stand before my Father. So if you're here this morning, every eye open because we love you and we're all for you. And you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life and you want to. Right in front of this group and we'll celebrate you. 
raise your hand. Let's just settle the issue today. No need to go out of here uncertain. Anybody? I want to be born again today, Brother Marty. Put up your hand where I can see it. Sorry for the shower. Amen. Put up your hand where I can see it. Anybody? Okay, so I'm not going to be labored all right now. If you're here today, you're born again, like I was as a Baptist boy, but you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference, friends, in being born of the Spirit and being baptized with the Spirit. There's a difference between the Spirit within, which every Christian has the Holy Spirit within them. You can't be a Christian unless you do. If you've confessed Jesus, he lives on the inside of you. But then there's the baptism, which means to be immersed both inwardly and outwardly, where the Spirit comes upon you to empower you to live this Christian life. And accompanying that is a supernatural language that the Bible calls unknown tongues. We read about it. It's all in the book of Acts. It isn't scary. It's normal Christianity where you can communicate out of your spirit to God. It's a language that doesn't come from the mind. It comes out of the spirit. I've never learned that language. I'm from the South. It's difficult to speak English for some Southerners. Comes up out of your belly. If you're here this morning and you've never received that and you feel confident that you're ready, if not, listen, there's no pressure. There'll always be an opportunity, but we want to give you that opportunity. I'll lay hands on you. I'm not going to push you down or shake you around. I'm going to gently lay my hands and Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Anybody want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand if you do. Anybody? Raise your hand real high where I can see it. Anybody? I'm going to give you a chance. All right. All right, so this is very encouraging. We got born-again, spirit-filled people in the house. I want you to start my track because here's what I want to do just for a moment. If you don't mind waiting with me on the Lord, and let's let Him anoint us with fresh oil. And what, what, you know, when Paul gave the analogy, don't be drunk with wine, be filled with the Spirit, that was a perfect analogy. Why? Because in the natural, for a person to become drunk in the natural, which we don't advocate, but if you do, what do you have to do? You have to drink until your blood becomes saturated with the substance of alcohol. If you want to be saturated with the presence and person of the Holy Spirit, you drink until, and then you continue to drink. And one way you can drink is by praying in that supernatural language. So we're going to spend just a few moments, and don't let it intimidate you if you haven't received that yet. You can just ask Him to do that for you right now, but don't be bothered by it, all right? I want you to turn up that track. I want you to fill the house with it just for a moment. Turn it up. Turn that track up. Turn it up. A little more, please. Now I want you to lift your hands. And let's begin just to pray for a moment. This is who you are. We're not praying for interpretation. We're praying for edification right now, which is scriptural. Father, I'm asking you to pour out your spirit on this house this morning. I'm asking you to saturate every person with your holy presence. Anoint them, Lord, with fresh oil from heaven and use them, Father. Oh, Satalidil Yezu Rishi Karino Mokanzurre Bakrata. Oh, Radababavre de Bakarigi. Oh, Rasanda de Bograin de Christi Christ. Oh, Sukadale Giligron de la Boron de la Varasto, fulfill every vessel. Ye, Papa, Rasoro Sendele de Lacataisic. Melody de Bobron de Revri Arija Reza Laboro Sande. Keep praying. Keep praying. Oh, Rasafarici. Oh, Socorro the mighty de Bilivian Dosel. 
Jesu tarare de batresh tikara ora mai di bilivo rombo babo bala fazo vorrego go gronda la de bakaisa ye papa Ola bosso rimo mai di di videles o resho we hunger for you father we thirst for you we long for your spirit to manifest in our midst through our lives Oh, let's just speak just for a few more moments. Esu kar de borrebel papa lama na mai de borrebel bobon de la badai so reboro si kareke ed er de bajoro serisheka orose Christe. Oh, ser de la mai de barre no na 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 ma na 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 ma na 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 ma no 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 na na ma onchi. It's a da da bara da da bara sa bara da da bara endo bara. It's a da da bara da da bara so da 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 bara ja da 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 bara diato. It's a da da la 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 mon da 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 bara endo ria resto. It's a da 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 bara ria 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 We thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says to teach one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The word of the Lord came to me in a psalm about this time and season. And I want to admonish you with it. He said the spirit is calling to hearts that will hear to arise now in this hour. and to move boldly without fear for the time is short and the work is great so don't pull back don't hesitate because the world stands in need of the glory of god even now i am anointing those who will receive and i'm sending forth to do great exploits those who will believe and your eyes will behold what has been spoken and foretold as you stretch forth your hands in faith say not i i'm not worthy i cannot go i cannot do because my blood has made you worthy and remember it's i not you so arise and take this glorious gospel that resides within your spirit and preach and prophesy and declare and demonstrate and let the world hear and let them see it for the door that now stands open it will soon begin to close as with swiftness and acceleration this final season goes and yet there is a remnant that still must enter in and once they've taken their place in the kingdom then the time of sorrows will begin so listen carefully to the spirit for he speaks of things to come and let your heart be strengthened let the father's will be done by being mindful of his presence in every step that you take and by staying filled with his spirit an impact in the lives of many you will make thank you lord thank you lord thank you jesus and his presence will overtake you and his glory men will see and Jesus will be glorified in you and in me thank you father oh lord we love you i thank you now for just saturating every person here may they leave this place this morning with a tangible residue of your presence and let others sense that when they come into their presence we love you we love you we love you hallelujah praise
praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we love you. We thank you for this wonderful, wonderful presence of the Spirit of God, Lord. We thank you, Father. I'm sorry, but something was just quickened to me. Everybody's hands down. If you're here in this building and you have infirmity, any kind of sickness in your body, uh, or you need healing, we just talked about we're carriers, right? I want you to raise your hand if you need healing in your body. Just raise your hand, all right? Keep it up now. If you can't, uh, uh, of course, I know some aren't standing, but if you see a hand now, here's what I want you to do. Keep them up. Because I want the believers that are standing around, at least one person, because I see there's several hands, find somebody's hand that's up, and I want you to lay your hands upon them gently. And I want you to minister the life of God to them. All right, so if their hand is raised and you're next to them, put your hand on them. Turn around if you need to. There's somebody right behind you guys. There's some, there's, okay. Everybody, if you don't have a hand on you and you're needing healing, wave it at me. If somebody's not, you don't have a hand on you. Somebody find this hand waving. There's one over here. All right, they're coming. Now listen, minister the life of God that is in you to that individual. Saturate them with the life of God. Pray gently in the Spirit, and I'll speak the name. In the name of Jesus, every infirmity under the sound of my voice, I command you to go, dissipate, disappear, every kidney problem every stomach problem every arthritic problem every nerve problem every heart problem in the name of jesus with the pancreas with the colon with the liver in the name of jesus healing flow infirmity go in jesus name paralysis of any kind in the name of Jesus, infirmities go now. In Jesus' name, every spirit of infirmity, we adjure you by Jesus Christ to leave these bodies and do not return. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your healing power right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And as you go today, you do things maybe that you couldn't do and in, a, as in acting upon that. And thank God that you're healed and you believe it. Thank you, Lord. We just want to say thank you for tuning in today. We pray that the word touched your life today. And we encourage you, if you're not part of a good church, get plugged in. You need a church body. If you're in the channel area, we would love to have you come visit us anytime We'd like to shake your hand and get to know you. If you're watching today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer. The Bible says this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm gonna say a simple prayer. You pray it with me, you'll be born again. Here's the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. He died for my sins and on the third day, he was raised back to life. Today, I acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there's some information on the screen below. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. God bless you. It's going to be a great day.